Amen. So I have two kids. I have my son, Reese, who's five, and my daughter, Beck, who's two, and they're crazy people. And I have tons of stories, and there's, I, was, I could be here forever just telling you crazy stories about the kids. But one of the things that maybe if you have little kids, you also maybe know this or feel this. So my son has this stuffed animal lion that is absolutely crucial to the makeup of who we are as a family. Without it, we all fall apart. Everything goes awry. So he's got this stuffed animal lion, and it is well used. It's disgusting to hold. It's like so gross. All of the beans that were in it are out of it. You know, he's had it forever. But it's especially important at bedtime. When he goes to bed, he needs this lion. And it just like, I don't know how this happens. And maybe if you have kids, you're in the same boat. We lose it every single day. And it's like, it's so important. But every night we're like, you know, where's, where's the lion? And there have been days where we've been running errands and doing stuff, and we're like, we can't find it. And I have to, like, get in my car and retrace our steps and go, where did we leave this thing? So I'm, like, going places, trying to find it because it's absolutely essential. Anyway, but it always sort of happens that it's, like, stuffed in a couch cushion or it's, like, in some other toy or something like that. But we always have this moment. We've been looking and looking and looking, and we find it. And it is, like, this huge, like, yes. And when we show it to Reese, like, hey, we found it, he's like so happy because this thing means so much and it's a huge deal to find it because it's really important to him and valuable to him. And I shared that story to start off this morning because I want all of us to be in that headspace and think about that idea of finding something incredibly important and valuable. I have this like secret dream of being at an antique store and finding something that's like $5, but I know it's worth millions, you know? <laughs> You're like, I found it, you know what I mean? Like, it's never happened and it probably never will, but you know, never say never. Uh, but anyway, so I, I like, I have that secret sort of dream, but I want all of us to be thinking about that idea of like you find something that is so valuable and you, you immediately recognize its worth. It means so much to you because that's the idea behind these two parables that we're going to talk about and look at today. They're two very short, like one sentence, quick parables that again, they're simple and they're easy. They're short. And, but what he does, he, he lists two of them, one after the other, and they're the exact same idea, but he just kind of comes at them from two different ways which Jesus would do a lot where he would list sort of an idea. He'd tell you one story about the parable of the lost coin, and then he'd follow it up with the parable of the lost sheep, which are like the exact same idea, but he wants to make sure that as many people as possible can hear it. So he comes at it from two different angles. And so we're going to look at these two parables, and they are very quick and they're very simple, but they leave us with some huge questions. And they put this massive challenge just in our lap that we have to wrestle with and think about and face. And, I, you know, we talk, Pastor Josh talked about this, too, in this series, that Jesus would just sort of say these things and then be like, all right, bye. And you're like, huh? Like, wait a minute. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? And so we're going to wrestle with those things today. So we're going to read now these two parables just sort of back to back. The first one, or they're both in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to start Matthew 13, verse 44. This is Jesus talking. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. That's the first parable we're going to look at. Super simple, just this one idea. And I want us to notice a couple of things in this. So the first thing that listeners would have noticed is that if you had something really valuable, very important, or worth a lot of money, the very common practice would be to bury it in your yard or in your field because there were no banks or safety deposit boxes. So if you had something that you didn't want to get stolen or didn't want to get destroyed, you would bury it. That's exactly what you would do. And so the sort of immediate thing they would think is, if this is something buried in this field that is incredibly valuable, it was so worth it to whoever you know, owned that thing or whatever that treasure was to bury it, to keep it safe. So immediately they're clued into this is valuable. This is something worth a lot that this man has found. The other thing I want us to see is that in this particular story, this, sort of, this guy just sort of happens upon this. It's almost an accident. He stumbles upon this incredible thing and he sees it. He then hides it again to make sure nobody else can take it, to make sure it's safe, to make sure it's, that, he, that he can have it. And then he sells everything he has in order to buy the field so he can have the treasure, this incredibly valuable thing. But he just sort of stumbles upon it almost by accident. 
So that's the first parable. And then Jesus, next verse down in verse 45 of chapter 13 says this, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Now this is, uh, again, the, sort of the same idea, but the only thing I want us to notice in this one is this is a person who's seeking, who's looking. There's this merchant of pearls and he's on the lookout, he's actively looking and seeking for this pearl. And when he finds this pearl of great value, it's so worth it to him to sell everything he has to have the pearl. He gets rid of everything. It's worth it to him to lay it all down, to give it all so he can have the pearl. And so both of these men come at this thing from different, you know, different sort of ideas. One of them sort of stumbles upon it. The other one is actively looking for it. But for both of them, the point is... This is so valuable, this thing that I've come across or this thing that I've been looking for. And it's worth it to me to make sure that I have it. It's worth it to me to give everything to have it. If they have to lose it all, it's a happy trade for them. I need to make sure that I get this treasure that is so valuable to me so I will lose it all. I will give it all to make sure that I have it. And so here are these two very simple ideas, these two simple parables, but they leave some huge questions and challenges for us. And so I think there's two questions that these parables put before us that we have to wrestle with and think about, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The first question that I think we need to talk about is, what is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God? This treasure that's in this field, this pearl that this man finds, what is that? What is the kingdom of heaven? That's what Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this treasure, So what is the kingdom of heaven? What is that treasure? What exactly is it that we're talking about? And the second question that I think this parable is throwing in our face is, and what is the kingdom worth to you? What's it worth? So that's what we're going to look at today, those two questions. What is the kingdom of heaven, and what is it worth to me? What is it worth to you? So question number one, what is the kingdom of heaven? The first thing to say here is you'll see in your Bible sometimes two different things used. You'll see kingdom of heaven and you'll see kingdom of God, which are the same idea. So both of those things, whether he says the kingdom of heaven is like or the kingdom of God is like or the kingdom, it all means the same thing. So as you read your Bible, you see all those different words used, but it all is the same thing, the kingdom of heaven. The other thing to say is that Jesus talked, the the thing he talked about the most was the kingdom of heaven. This was his number one thing that he talked about, that he made sure people knew about, was the good news about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And that's really important for us, and that should sort of raise the alarms a little bit in us, because Jesus had three years to talk about what he wanted to talk about. Three years to make sure that he said what he needed to say, and he spent most of that time talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. So this is a verse here. This is Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And this is just like, I would say, a summary of what Jesus was doing while he was here on the earth. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. That's what Jesus did. All the time, wherever he went, he talked about the good news of the kingdom of God, and he healed people of their diseases and their illnesses. That's what Jesus was doing. He talked about the kingdom of God. Jesus came to establish the kingdom when he came here to this earth. So Jesus came to talk about the kingdom of God. He came to establish that kingdom. But we need to realize and recognize, and what we're going to look at is that this is a completely new kind of kingdom. There's nothing like this. There's nothing you can compare this to. It's completely new and unique. So he's bringing a very new kingdom that's going to have a brand new kind of person. It's about, he's bringing brand new humanity into this. This is a kingdom unlike anything you've ever seen. And the people that are in this kingdom are unlike any other person. There's going to be uniqueness to them. There's something different that's going to be about those people that are a part of the kingdom. It's a new kingdom with a new people and a new kind of king. You've never seen anyone like this king before who's going to rule and reign in this kingdom over a brand new kind of people. So this is the part of the treasure that we're starting to uncover, this amazing thing that we've found in this field, the kingdom of God. So I've got three things to say quickly here about the kingdom of God to help us just recognize what a treasure it is. The first thing is that the kingdom is now and it's not yet. It's now and it's not yet. This is one of the sort of paradoxes that we wrestle with 
in our faith that is actually really profound and means a whole lot to us. The kingdom is right now, and it's still coming. There's something happening now and something on the way. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, this is Jesus. So, so from the time that Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Other translations say the kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven has come. So there's this reality that Jesus shows up, and with his arrival, he announces the new kingdom. The kingdom of God is right here, right now. But there's another spot in Luke 19, another parable that I'm not going to read because I don't want to steal from somebody if they're going to preach on this parable later. So trust me, you can go look at it. In Luke 19, there's a whole story about the reality that the kingdom isn't fully here yet, that it's coming, that there's this something in the future that's going to happen that's going to usher in the kingdom of God. So it's both here and it's not fully here. There's a reality that we live in now of the kingdom of God, and there's a future reality, and both of those things are good for us. Both of those things are a treasure when we look at it. And the first thing to say is the kingdom of God being here is a treasure. The fact that we as human beings can live right here, right now, and experience the kingdom of God in our lives, that there isn't just something that we have to look forward to, but there is something right now that we can be a part of this sort of life that Jesus wants us to live, this kind of love and mercy and grace that he wants us to live in and operate out of. So there is a reality right now we get to experience that kingdom of God, which we're gonna continue to talk about. But the other good thing is that there is a kingdom coming. Because here's the reality for us. We live in a lot of brokenness and pain and hurt, and that's true. And a lot of us in this room have experienced tons of brokenness and pain and hurt. And maybe you're in it right now. And it is so good, this treasure of the kingdom of God, to say, but something is coming that is so much better than this. There is a reality that is coming that everything gets answered. All of the pain and the hurt and the brokenness gets fixed. And we get to live in the kingdom of God, which is how God wants life to be for us. I want everybody today, if you have a second, to go read Revelation chapter 21. It's this amazing chapter that looks forward to this ultimate final moment when the, he- the, the kingdom of heaven finally arrives, and it's that God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There's no more pain. There's no more brokenness. It's beauty, and it's good. So the kingdom of heaven is a treasure because we get to experience it now. It's here. It's in our midst. It's in us, this reality that we get to live in that's different from our reality of brokenness and, bro- and, and pain and all of this. We get to live in something else, but it's also a treasure because it's coming, and there is something to look forward to, and the brokenness and the pain of our world will get fixed one day in the kingdom of God. The kingdom is now, and it's not yet. The second thing here about the kingdom is that it's a different kind of kingdom. There's nothing else like this. And this was a a, a particularly um, interesting challenge for the disciples and the people around Jesus when he was talking about this, because they had an image of what the kingdom of God was going to be, which was a real kingdom. Like, here's a place, and there's a leader who's going to rule over all of us, and we'll be able to walk in the gates and be at kingdom of heaven headquarters, you know? Like, it's going to be a real thing that we get to be a part of. And that wasn't exactly what Jesus had in mind. And so this is a completely new kind of kingdom. Luke 17, 20 through 21 says this. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Right, this really practical question. When's it coming? Like, gonna actually be here. And Jesus says this. Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. This really sort of interesting mystery verse here, this thing saying from Jesus, you won't be able to say, oh, it's right there. Oh, we can just go there. Come with me. Here's where the kingdom of God is. It's among you. It's in your midst. It's happening here in your heart. It's happening inside each and every believer. When you put your trust and your hope and your faith in Jesus, the kingdom starts happening in your heart. So you can't say, oh, there it is. Let's go there. It's here. God's doing something in your heart, which is incredibly valuable. There's not a place that we go to to experience the kingdom of God. The place is here. The place is in you where you get to experience the kingdom of God. The kingdom is not like anything else that we've seen. The third thing, the kingdom is the rule and reign of Christ in you. That's the kingdom of God. The rule and the reign of Jesus Christ in you. 
It's not something that's happening out here. It's happening right here in us where we experience Jesus ruling and reigning in our life. Romans 14 verse 17 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not a matter of stuff out there. This is, but it's a matter of your life, how do you live with joy and peace in the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The kingdom of God is not something happening out there. It's something happening right here. It's something happening in you. And that's a treasure. That's valuable. That can't be taken away from you because it's happening here. God's transforming your heart one day at a time into the kingdom of God. So the kingdom is now and it's not yet. We get to enjoy it now and look forward to it. It's a different kind of kingdom. It's not just a place, but it's happening in our heart. And it's the rule and reign of Jesus in our life. So if you want to know what the kingdom of God looks like, how it operates, we look at the life of Jesus. Because he lived the kingdom of God right in front of us. Look at the way Jesus lived. That's the kingdom it's love and it's mercy and, it's, and it's, it's forgiveness and it's correction and it's all of these beautiful things in our life. This is what the kingdom of God is. This is the treasure that we see right here before us. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. And the other thing we have to do here is you cannot separate the kingdom from the king. You can't separate the kingdom from the king. We have to talk about the king of this kingdom because he is this treasure that we find. This reality that he's bringing into our life, this new way of living is because of him, is because of Jesus. And so I know you all just came out of a series before Easter about how awesome Jesus is. We're going right back for a second, okay? We're gonna talk about how beautiful and wonderful and what a treasure Jesus is. Because sometimes what happens, unfortunately, is we talk about this so often because it's so important that we get familiar with it and it becomes less special. It becomes less of a treasure. And so I want to remind us, some of these things that we know by heart, we need to put out there again and go, look at how beautiful this is. Look at what a treasure this is, how valuable it is. So the first thing to say here that I think is amazing and that I don't think was lost on Jesus when he said this parable because I, I, this parable is about the kingdom of God, about us finding it, but I don't think it's lost on Jesus that he did this parable for us, that Jesus had something so valuable to him, which was you, that he gave everything to get it, to buy it, to say, you're mine. Jesus did everything. Jesus did this parable for us. And I think when he was saying it, I don't think it was lost on him that he said, I'm going to do this. So that's the first thing I want to recognize about the value of Jesus is he did this for you, gave everything, emptied himself. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, one of my favorite little chunks of scripture here. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Incredible verse. But what I want us to see there is that Jesus emptied himself, gave it up, said, I'm gonna leave all of it just so I can have you, just so that I can come and I can say, you're mine. Jesus did this parable. So a couple of points here on the beauty and the value of Jesus in our lives to be reminded of so we don't get used to it, but we can go, what an incredible treasure. The first thing to say is that Jesus paid this price for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners, still broken, still flawed, still not living the life we were supposed to live. He didn't wait for us to get it right. He said, I'm gonna go now. While they're still broken, while they're still sinners, I am going to die for them. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. We can't get used to that. That's not normal. That's an incredible kind of king. I'm going to come do this while you're still sinners. 
I'm not going to wait for you to figure this thing out, and I'm not going to send just more messages or more ideas that you should come to or, 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 or try to think about and realize I'm going to come, and I'm going to pay this price while you are still broken, while you're still a sinner. That's a treasure. When we find that kind of king who's going to rule in our life that says, I will pay it all for you while you're still messed up, that's an incredible king. That's a treasure. The second thing to recognize here is that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. We can't get used to that because we as human beings have this natural tendency to just keep a hold of shame and guilt in our lives. And when we mess up, we feel like we've messed up and we've got to do something now to earn something back or we feel like maybe we've messed up too much, we've gone too far. And what Jesus wants us to know is I came for you while you were still sinners and if you accept that, there is this, there's Romans chapter eight, verse one. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen. There's no condemnation. There is nothing that's too far. There is nothing that's too much if you belong to Jesus. He wants you to know that. That's a treasure. When we see that kind of king who dies for us while we're still sinners and then says, and by the way, don't ever hold condemnation over yourself because I've paid that price. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And then this one, nothing can get in the way of you and Jesus. Nothing can get in the way of his love for you. Amen. There is nothing. Romans 8, 37 through 39. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced, everybody get ready for this, okay? Buckle up. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. Nothing. There is no power anywhere. There's nothing you can do. There's no mistake you can make that can separate you, can get in between that kind of love. That's a treasure. And we can't get used to that. We can't just let that be. Oh, that's really cool. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. We need to recognize this is the king of this kingdom that says, by the way, there's nothing. There is no power that you even know about or a power you don't know about that can get in the way of this because I love you. That's the kind of king this is. So let's recognize this treasure the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. Yes, it is. This incredible reality we get to live in now and look forward to. This thing that Jesus has started in our hearts and day by day, we're looking more and more like him and we're living more and more like him in his kingdom and he is the ruler of our heart and he is the one that rules and reigns in our life and he is this king of this kingdom who loves us unlike anybody else loves us more than anybody else loves us and says nothing is going to get in the way of that love. That's the treasure that we find in this field. That's the pearl that we've been looking for. That's the kingdom of God. And so then the huge question that this parable is throwing at us is what is this worth to you? What's it worth to have this? What would you give? What would you sacrifice if needed for this kingdom? And here's where I want to pose sort of, a, sort of a challenging thing here because I think the reality for a lot of Christians in America is this is worth basically nothing. And that's uncomfortable to think about for a second. But I want us to think about it because we're going to ask ourselves this question, what is it worth to me? Because for a lot of people, it's worth maybe once a week. That's what I'll give one day a week for that. But the rest of the week is whatever I want. And it's however I want to do it. And for a lot of people, it's only two times a year. That's what I'll give Jesus. That's what the kingdom of God is worth to me is Christmas and Easter. That's uncomfortable and that's challenging to think about, but I'm just going to say it here because we need to ask ourselves the question, what is it worth to me? What's it worth? When life gets busy and overwhelming, what's the first thing to go? For a lot of people, it's Jesus. And it's thinking about that and it's going to church and it's being a part of the kingdom of God. That, life's busy, that can go because we have other things we have to do. What's it worth to you? What's it worth to me? We need to ask ourselves the question because that's what this parable is asking us. What's it worth to you? What would you give? What's it worth? So here's where I want to say this. It's worth it. It is so worth it. 
in every single moment in my life that I've come up to where something has to move, I've got to get rid of something, it's going to cost me something to follow Jesus, it's been worth it every single time to follow Jesus. And I know in my life I will continue to come up against moments where there's going to be challenges, where I go, do I get rid of this? Does this move? Do I have to sacrifice something to keep following Jesus? And the reality and the answer is it's worth it. It's so worth it. The Apostle Paul in Philippians says it like this. And he's just listed all of this awesome stuff about him, all these incredible qualifications that Paul has. And he says this in Philippians 3, 7 through 8. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I want to pause there. The infinite value of knowing him. Not the infinite value of what Jesus does in my life. Not the infinite value of all of these blessings that he brings in. The infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. That is worth everything to me. For this sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage, which like the word there is a lot stronger than garbage in Greek, and I'll just, we'll leave it at that, okay? But counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. I think Paul has to be thinking about this parable as he says this. Everything else is worthless. It's garbage when compared to knowing Jesus. And I would happily, gladly give it up to gain Christ. That's what we're talking about here. Wherever following Jesus takes me or takes you, it'll be worth it. Wherever it follows, wherever it takes us, it will be worth it to follow Jesus. Whatever it costs us will be worth it. And for some people in this room, for a lot of people throughout church history, it's cost a whole lot, but it's been worth it. And I kept thinking this week, writing this message about these hymns, these old songs that we've sung throughout generations, and I couldn't help but was kind of singing to, to myself and saying them to myself as I was writing this, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. That's a treasure. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus, to know that everything's going to be okay, and I can actually lose it all and follow him, but I still say it's sweet to trust in Jesus. I surrender all, all to him. I freely give worldly pleasures all forsaken." I surrender everything. That's what I am here to do, and it's worth it to me. And then every single Sunday, I don't know if you know this, but every single Sunday, the worship team and the tech team gather back in a room over here, and they sing a song, and they sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious grace. I kept thinking about that song this week. When you look at Jesus, the treasure in the kingdom, everything else grows dim. And I realized that all of this other stuff would actually be nothing to me just so I could have that. That's the reality that I want to live in. That's the goal I want to set before me, the treasure that I find in the kingdom of God and in the king. He's not an accessory to my life. He's not something I hold on to on the side and I have every other piece. He's all of it. He's what I'm giving it all for, and he's worth it to do that. So here's where I want to end. I want us to remember, I think we have to bring this up when we talk about this thing. I want us to remember who this God is we're giving everything for. Because nobody else is worth that, by the way. Nobody else, nothing else is worth you giving everything. Nobody else can handle that except Jesus. So I want us to remember who this God is that we're giving everything for. And there's a million verses I could have put in here about how much God cares for you, how much God loves you and cares for you and knows what you need. Because when we give everything to be with Jesus, he cares for us and he knows what we need. That's part of this treasure as well. Matthew 6, 31 through 33, is, and right before this has been these questions about what are we going to eat? What are we going to do? What are we going to drink? Where, what are we going to wear? All of these worries. And Jesus says this. So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. That's a treasure. And I, we can't lose sight of that. We can't have a message that just says, give everything to God without saying this, that he cares for you. And he knows everything you need. And it's worth it to lose it all because he has got you. 
And it may cost you everything in life, but he cares for you and he knows what you need. And I love the, the, what Jesus says in this passage and other places. He says, aren't, aren't you so much more valuable to me than birds? But I care for their every need. But aren't you so much more valuable to me than that? So he says, you can give everything to me, but you are so valuable to me that I'll care for you and I'll make sure that you have what you need. And even when life gets crazy and it's difficult and you've lost it all, I'm there for you and I care for you and I know what you need. We can trust that this morning. And so, is it worth it? The kingdom of God, the treasure, is it worth it? It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it today. It's worth it tomorrow. It's worth it next week. Whatever comes up in your life, whatever the thing is that you go, do I have to lose this to follow Jesus? It's worth it. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much, and we are grateful, God, for this time that we get to be here together. God, first off, I thank you for your unbelievable love for us, your care for us. God, help us to recognize right here in this moment, you know everything we need and that you care for us. We want to rest in that reality and that promise right now that you care for us. You know what we need. And so Jesus, help us to be those people that we've, we've seen this treasure, we've seen this amazing thing, the kingdom of God and the king that comes with it. It's beautiful, God. It's a treasure. It's valuable. So Holy Spirit, help us every single day to say it's worth it to follow. It's worth it just to have this incredible reality of the kingdom of God and the king in my life. God, this is difficult for us at times. And this sometimes, I don't want to make light of it, costs a lot. It can cost so much. And the lie that we're tempted to believe is it's not worth it to give it all. It's not worth it. There's nothing that can, that can make this sacrifice worth it. God, help us to shut that lie down in Jesus' name and say it's worth it to follow. It's worth it to have you. It's worth it to be with you, whatever it costs us. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful reality we get to live in called the kingdom of God. And help us to live in it and walk in it and build it and reveal it in the world, what you're doing in us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.